And now let's turn to God's word together. And our reading uh, this morning is from the New Testament, from the book of Colossians, chapter 2. And I'm going to read from verse 6. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. And uh, while you're finding the place, can I just take this opportunity to welcome any who are watching on live streaming. Um, it's really lovely to have you with us today. So Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. Just a few verses here. Paul writes, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. Well, we'll leave the reading there. We thank God for his word. And let's just pray together as we look at it now for a few minutes. Father, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you that we have your whole word, the Bible, in front of us. This morning, Lord, already we've remembered that there are those around the world who have just perhaps a page or a few verses and would love to have your word in front of them to be able to read it day by day. And Lord, we are so blessed that we can just open it whenever we want to and read it and meditate upon it. Lord, we pray that your living word would live for us each one of us here today, each one listening uh, on the live streaming or perhaps to the recording, Lord, may your word accomplish your purposes in our lives. For your glory we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So our text or texts um, this morning are verses 6 and 7. Colossians 2 verses 6 and 7. Okay, can I read them again? As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. So if we were to make this verse personal today and reread it in that way, let's see how it sounds, shall we? I have received Christ Jesus the Lord and am walking in him rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as I have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Is that your testimony today? Can you say that this morning? I have received Christ Jesus the Lord. I am walking in him. Well, Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote this letter, to the church at Colossae is talking here about Christian progress. Christian progress. And that's really important. Because when we, get, when we become a Christian, when we give our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, we're not meant to stand still. In fact, the whole of the scriptures 
scream at us to say, well, don't just stand there. Get going. Move forward. So these verses are really all about Christian progress. And he uses words, interestingly, that seem to contradict each other. Have you noticed that? They express the same idea, but they sort of contradict each other. He says, um, we should be walking, but we should be rooted. <laughs> Tricky, <coughs> you might think. And not only should we be walking and rooted, but we should be built up. Receiving Christ, being rooted in him, being founded on him, walking in him, growing up from the root in him, being built up on him as our foundation, established and abounding in him. That should be you, that should be me, as we live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Christian progress is the evidence of an inward possession in the heart. It's the visible evidence of a treasure which is hidden there in our hearts, which once we never had, but which now we do have. And that treasure is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And Paul says here, doesn't he, in verse 6, as you therefore have received Christ. That's what happens to us when we give our lives to him. It's not just a decision that we make, important though that is, we actually receive him. We receive Christ into our hearts and into our lives. So let's ask a question. How does this Christian progress begin? Well, pardon me for going back to basics, but I think it's important. We receive Christ when we put our faith and trust in him. And at that very moment, we're born again. A miracle takes place in our lives. We're forgiven. Praise God. We are forgiven. Not we will be forgiven, but we are. Love to preach a sermon on that. Haven't got time today. But we are forgiven. We're rooted in him. We're anchored. No, we could sing another lovely old hymn, couldn't we? We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure when the billow, that's a lovely hymn, isn't it? When the billows roll. <clears throat> We're anchored. His life flows into us. We draw nourishment from the soil being rooted in him, which is Christ. We're built on him, and in our union with him, we find a new and real fullness of life, which we've never known before. Up until that point, our lives have been foundationless. Like the house that was built on the sand. <coughs> Foundationless. Now we're standing on the rock, which is Christ Jesus. No other foundation has been laid, can be laid, other than the rock that is Christ Jesus. From that very moment, Christ possesses us and we possess him. There's another sermon. <laughs> As I was preparing this the other day, I thought to myself, my word, we've got a series coming here. These are wonderful themes, aren't they? At that very moment, Christ possesses us, he owns us. Our lives are given to him, and we, in turn, possess him. All that is Christ 
is ours. We don't share him. Did you know that? You know, we don't share Christ. We possess him. Praise God. Can there be a more wonderful experience in the whole of human existence? I don't think so. To be able to say that, Christ possesses me and I possess him. Wow. Now, as you know, Linda and I just come back from a, a, a holiday. We went, we went up to Scotland. We took three days to get there, which at our great age is increasingly necessary. We used to do it in one day, now it took three. And um, eventually we arrived in uh, a place called Leg, which is a few miles, about 100 miles or so, north of Inverness. So we're right up in the north of Scotland, in the county of Sutherland, which is wild and barren, okay? And we checked into this little cottage that we rented, um, and which was very good, very nice, and we settled down there for a week. During our time up there, we travelled about quite a bit, and on one occasion we went to a place called Rogi Falls. Rogie Falls. Now, Rogie Falls is about 40 miles northeast of Inverness. A wonderful waterfall. Um, can you see a picture of that on the screen there? Yes. Rogie Falls. Now, um, there's a suspension bridge over the falls. And if you're brave enough, you can walk across the suspension bridge uh, and stand in the middle while it does this, and look over at the falls, which is difficult to see perhaps from the photograph, but they're about 100 feet below. Okay, pretty tall, um, or pretty deep, whichever way you want to look at it. And uh, only six people are allowed on the bridge at any one time. And it says if Ian Masson is visiting, only four. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately for us, or fortunately for Linda, I should say, the bridge was closed <laughs> for repairs, so we weren't able to walk across, but we stood on one side and looked over the falls, and the noise was amazing. You know, I mean, unless we were standing literally next to each other, we couldn't hear each other speak. Tremendous noise of the water going over these falls. And it's very impressive, isn't it? Whenever you see a, a wonder of nature like that, it really does make an impression on you. And um, if you look at the um, uh, <coughs> the falls from the other side, and uh, Tim's going to show us a picture of that now, um, there's a fence that I was standing behind when I took this photograph. If you look from, at the falls from the other side, there's a tree that I noticed. Now, can you see this tree? There's an arrow pointing at it, all right? This tree, if these are the falls, if this is the, uh, the rock face going down 100 feet to the uh, water below, this tree that you can see there on the picture was growing here. And the trunk is growing out so that the branches of the leaves are actually overhanging the falls, which is 100 feet straight down. Okay. Now I stood on the side looking at this tree from behind that fence for ages, didn't I, Lynn? And Lynn was thinking, what's he doing? What's he doing? And I was just looking at this tree thinking, my word, isn't that amazing? It's standing on the rock. And it was rock. There was very little of anything else. It's just rock just a covering of soil and moss but somehow it had taken root there and it had grown over the years and as you can see it's an established tree okay and it's spreading and it's flourishing just where it is nobody had to come along and say right we've got to pluck you up 
now that you're a couple of years old, and we'll put you somewhere else, and we'll let you grow there. No, the tree is growing where it is. And that spoke volumes to me about our Christian living. Okay? Because often we look around, don't we, and we say to ourselves, well, actually, I'd flourish a lot better as a Christian if I wasn't here. I'd actually rather be there. Or there. Or where he is. I reckon his life's better than mine. I'd like to swap with him. Or with her. Or if I didn't have these particular circumstances to deal with, or this family issue, or other things that go on, I'd be much more productive and make much more progress as a Christian. And that tree spoke to me that day when I was at Rogie Falls and said, no, 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 no. You cling to the rock and flourish just where you have been put. And that's what God says to us. That's what he says to you. He says to me, grow there. Flourish there. Be fruitful there. Nowhere else. So I just want to share that photograph with you just to illustrate that point today. But Paul says, if we go back to our text in 2 Colossians, uh, Colossians 2, sorry, 6 and 7, he says, don't just stand there. And this is where the analogy breaks down a little bit. Because the tree has to stand there, doesn't it? It can't go anywhere else. <laughs> Make progress in your life with Christ. But we need to remember that there can't be any progress without the initial step of receiving him. And that's important not to miss. Because if you've never received Christ, if you're a polished churchgoer, an accomplished churchgoer, and have never received Christ, you can never make any progress in, in, in living as a Christian. Because you can't go anywhere until you've received him. Being a Christian is making a commitment, isn't it? To the person and work of Jesus Christ on the cross for us. Jesus died that we might be forgiven. He died to make us good, that we might go at last to heaven, saved by his precious blood. It's all about him and nothing to do with us. So, sadly, I think, in many churches and chapels up and down the country today, there are those who have never received Christ. So how can they progress in him? They practice what's called churchianity. Not Christianity. What do I mean? What's the difference? Well, in churchianity, the gospel has been replaced, or repackaged, if you like, into a sort of self-help message that has some Christian flavour, but has been stripped of the power and salvation's <clears throat> true meaning. Christianity, sorry, churchianity teaches a watered down, man centered gospel. Self help, self worship. That's what it's about. But because of the false message and the fact that it's broadcast under the guise of spirituality, many people think it's the gospel. And it isn't, it's a false gospel. Churchianity assures people that they're right with God because they listen to sermons or keep certain rules or attend certain meetings in church buildings. Churchianity wants to look good sitting in the pews or in the chairs. <clears throat> Churchianity avoids some obvious sins and tolerates other more socially acceptable sins. 
denies the word of God, essentially. Christ a churchianity encourages religiously minded people to make half-hearted, costless decisions that offer false assurance, but never result in a life which is transformed by the Lord Jesus Christ. So the result is an accomplished church gallery. <clears throat> but when we receive Christ and we put our faith and trust in him, at that very moment we're born again. And there is sure to be progress Sure to be ongoing growth in him if that vital step has been taken. It's not possible, I would say, you can argue with me about this after if you want to, it's not possible to stand still as a Christian. If Christ has been personally received, our life is transformed and will show In fact, the Bible goes further. It says we will go on, listen to this, to perfection. Can you imagine that? I can't. Ian Masson, perfect. Linda, what a thought. <laughs> Have you ever contemplated it? <laughs> what do you mean, no? <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing, isn't it? Go on to perfection because of what Jesus Christ will do in our lives. He will work through our whole character and our nature as the days and the weeks and the months and the years go by, making us more and more like himself. And that's the beginning. The beginning of Christian Progress. So let me ask another question. What does Christian progress consist of? Now, think about this. It consists of a more complete possession of the Lord Jesus Christ. And a greater, pardon the big word, but I couldn't think of a better one, a greater appropriation of him. Christian progress is not growing up from Christ as a starting point, but a growing into Christ as our goal. Now, that takes a bit of hanging on to, but it's true. We can grow into him, the rock, as we cling to him as we're founded on him. And as we go through life, life's journey, we get to know him better. He doesn't get to know us better, because he knows us already. But we get to know him, more of him, more about Jesus, what I know. We sing sometimes, don't we? More about Jesus, we learn more about him. I, you know, I, hopefully now, having been a Christian some years now, I know more of him than I did when I started when I was 16. I knew quite a lot about him then, but I didn't know much of him. But as we journey along, we learn more, don't we? We learn to love him more. And that's worked out through the rest of our lives. We learn to see him and we apply him in our lives, don't we? So we see him as the centre of all truth, all truth, as the revealer of God. This is what he does. He shows us the Father. As the teacher, the wonderful teacher, what a teacher he is. <laughs> wonderful. I'd just so love to have heard him during those three ministry years teaching the people, wouldn't you? No wonder they were spellbound. Just listen, we've never heard anything like this, they said. These words, nobody spoke like this, ever. 
nor since. The wonderful teacher. He interprets nature to us. Now we love nature, don't we? We live in a beautiful part of the world. Linda and I have just come back from a beautiful part of the world. Very different from this. But still beautiful. And nature speaks to us so clearly and loudly of our creator God and his amazing love for us, doesn't it? And in Christ we see things that we've never seen before. And we couldn't see in a thousand years without him. We see him as the beginning and the end of history. 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 That's his story. It's all about Jesus, isn't it? From beginning to end. We never knew that before. We know it now. Linda said to me this morning as we were driving out in the car, look at those clouds. Every time I see clouds like that, I think about Jesus coming. And he is coming one day. Could have been today. It might be later today. We don't know. Christ is coming. Hallelujah. And we know that that's true. And we receive more and more of his grace every day. He is the living ideal of whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are of good report, isn't he? He's the power by which we gradually become moulded into his likeness. Every part of our human nature finds its best in him. And he is the only way in which we can be presented perfect. Perfect in Christ. And that progress must follow the direction which Paul gives us here in Colossians 2, 6 and 7. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, Paul says, do this, do this. Walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. So the next question, how is this progress achieved? Well, as with any relationship, by keeping the channels of communication open. Now some of us have been married, and not all of us of course, but some of us have, and we all know, those of us who have been married or are married, that sometimes the communication channels get blocked <laughs> and problems happen. And um, perhaps words are said, but then after those words are said, no words <laughs> are said. And sometimes it can be for quite a long time. I remember going to um, a golden wedding celebration many years ago uh, out at Mattersham. We were invited uh, to attend this golden wedding event and um, I won't name the individual but he stood up and gave a little speech and he said one thing we've learned he said over the years 50 years of marriage he said um, we never go to sleep um, without making up if we've had a bad day if we've had a crossword and there's been an awkward silence for an hour or two or three or four he said, we always make up. He said, then we get up the next day and carry on where we left off. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh, 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 oh dear. What a shame. <laughs> but communication is important, isn't it? David preached on it when our daughter Ruth got married. I remember your message that day, David, was all about communication, wasn't it? Do you remember it? Yeah. And communication is vital, isn't it? And our communication with the Lord Jesus Christ is vital. So have you been communicating with him this week? Or have you just been going through the motions? You know, what time is it? Oh, seven o'clock, right, I pray now. Pray for a few minutes. But while you're praying, you're thinking about your shopping list or your dental appointment. Or, you know, it's so easy to do that, isn't it? So easy, so easy to get into this familiarity and into this routine. Communication is vital. We must live ever nearer the Lord. 
so that our communion with him is strengthened every day. Now what I want to do, as I summarise, because I realise the time is going, I just want to summarise these two verses, and it will be a summary, I'm not going to preach another sermon. I just want to summarise them with six words that begin with the letter R, because it helps us to remember. Okay? Six words. So you can see um, the text there on the screen. And the first R is the word receiving. Receiving. Paul says, as you therefore have received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. So we must receive him. Please don't forget that. If you've never received Christ, you must receive him. He wants you to receive him. His arms are open wide, saying, come to me, all you who labour with a heavy laden. I will give you rest. Don't delay. Run into his arms. And do it today. Don't walk out that door if you've never done it before. Don't walk out that door without receiving Christ. You must receive him. Secondly, roaming is our second R. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Roaming. Now, by roaming, I don't mean wandering about all over the place. I mean this. The path that we walk in our lives is always different. None of us are walking the same path. The jobs we do, the places we go, the people we know, the people we associate with, the families that we have, all these things are all different, aren't they? And we have a different path, a different route through life. But if we know the Lord Jesus Christ, it leads to him. One day we're going to be with him in glory. And we are set free by him to roam, to walk through this life. Our path to life is free, and our path through life is free. Remember the hymn, In Heavenly Love Abiding. You know this hymn? Green pastures are before me, which yet I have not seen. Bright skies will soon be o'er me, where darkest clouds have been. My hope I cannot measure. My path to life is free. My Saviour has my treasure. And he will walk with me. Hey! Okay? That's a promise. It's not a biblical promise in that sense, but it's a, it's a, a promise in that hymn. Okay? There are other verses that we could use to illustrate that. But he will walk with us. And he'll walk with you along your path, and he'll walk with me along my path. He'll walk with us. And we're free to roam with him. Thirdly, we must be rooted. Rooted. The tree at Rogie Falls is standing on the rock and flourishing. Remember the tree at Rogie Falls. Every time I thought about Rogie, I thought about Logie. <laughs> there was a little bit of a link there in my head. Progressing with Jesus means trusting God's <laughs> Holy Spirit. Asking him to do in you what you cannot do for yourself. doesn't mean being passive, you see. We're to be obedient. To walk with him, which means we journey on with him. I could say more. But for the sake of time, I won't. Fourthly, we are raised. Raised. Or in the verse it says, built up. Built up, verse 7. Yes, we're raised to new life in Christ, but we're also to be built up in him. <clears throat> Established, in other words. We'll come to that in a moment. Are you rejoicing today in being raised? Raised day by day. I hope you are. I hope so. 
Has this past week seen you making progress in your walk with the Lord? Will this new week be a week of progress in your walk with the Lord? The fifth thing is remaining. Remaining. It says in the verse, verse 7, that we should abound in it. That we should remain in him. That's where we want to be. Abounding in him. Remaining in him. Can you see? <coughs> We're to grow in Christ Jesus. To be transformed into his image. And come to full maturity as Christians. And we have a part to play in that. We all had a part to play in our maturing as individuals, didn't we? Some of us perhaps are still on that journey. <laughs> we have a part to play. And we can mature in Christ. So that we're not at the whim of all kinds of false teaching. And misleading teachings that have no basis in truth. Paul wrote some other verses actually in Ephesians 4 which are relevant to this. Let me just quote them. Ephesians 4.13 Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men by the crafty cunning the crafty Sorry, the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. We, if we remain in Christ, if we're established in him, that won't be a problem for us. And that's important because we live in a day where we're being pulled, if we're not careful, all over the place. I mean, just this past week, some of the stuff I've heard on the news and some of the decisions that are being made around the world. Oh, I mean, I could stand here and talk very easily politically about various things that just break my heart. Things that are going on in this country and abroad that just show us how broken this world is and how confused, grasping for the truth but not knowing where to find it. And we know the truth. Because the truth is Christ, and we are standing on him, and we are rooted in him. We cling to him. Lastly, I love this one, reveling. Reveling in him. Abounding in it, the verse says, verse 6, uh, verse 7. seven. Abounding in it with thanksgiving. We revel in him. When you revel in something, you just love it, don't you? You can think of all sorts of examples. I don't need to do that. I don't need to explain that. But are you reveling in Christ? In the fullness of all that he has for you? And all that you know him to be? Well, I trust that you are. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said this, and with this I'll close. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, he wrote, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding, or reveling, in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. Well, there we are. Christian progress. Are you progressing in your <laughs> Christian life? Are you walking with the Lord? Are you learning to love him more? To know him better? And seeking to serve him? Just where he's placed you. Like the tree at Rogi Falls. I hope to go back there one day, in a few years maybe, and I'll go up there and have a look, see if that tree is still there. I'm sure it will be. 
established, rooted and growing and flourishing. Well, may we flourish for the Lord Jesus Christ.